Good afternoon. My name is Paul Wax. I'm the executive director of the American College of Medical Toxicology, and I'd like to welcome you to our weekly uh, webinar series entitled The Medical and Public Health Considerations of COVID-19. Today we have a uh, very interesting and timely uh, presentation, uh, which is entitled An Alternative to Disposable N95s, the Reusable Elastomeric Half-Mask Respirator Experience. Next slide, please. I'd like to thank our webinar series partners for helping uh, to get out the word about our, our webinar series. Next slide, please. Uh, this uh, webinar, as well as uh, all of our webinars, are recorded and they're posted to our ACMT website in approximately 48 hours after the conclusion of the webinar. An email will be sent to all registrants uh, as soon as the webinar is posted. Uh, uh, along with these webinars, we've developed a series of Q&As uh, that are uh, in uh, tandem with many of the webinars, and these Q&As can be found at www.acmt.net forward slash C19 FAQ. Any questions about this webinar series can be addressed to us at info at acmt.net. Next slide. Uh, there will be a, a Q&A at the end of this webinar, so for those of you with questions, uh, we welcome your questions. Please either type them into the Q&A box or to the chat function box on the WebEx or on the Facebook Live uh, or Ustream uh, platforms, and we'll try to get to your questions at the end. Next slide. I'd like to thank my uh, co-moderator and colleague, uh, Dr. Charles McKay. He's past president of the American College of Medical Toxicology, and will be leading uh, the panel discussion uh, uh, during uh, this presentation. Next slide. At this point, I'd like to welcome uh, our, uh, our first speaker, uh, Dr. Stella Hines is board certified in occupational medicine, pulmonary medicine, critical care medicine, and internal medicine. She is an associate professor at the University of Maryland School of Medicine. And today she will be explaining the lessons learned from the hospital of elastomeric respirator use uh, pre-COVID-19. And at this time, I'd like to turn it over to Dr. Hines. Thank you very much. Um, it's a pleasure to be here today. And uh, I think our experience may be helpful in being able to inform um, policies and procedures for future users of elastomeric respirators. So I do receive research funding from the CDC and an investigator initiated research grant from Clean Space Technology, which is a respirator manufacturer. So this concept of using Elastomeric respirators in healthcare has been explored for more than a decade. And a 2018 report by the National Academies of Science actually recommended that elastomeric respirators be considered for routine and surge use, provided that logistics like cleaning and disinfection protocols are specified. And so as COVID-19 took off, um, back in February, CDC recommended that elastomeric respirators be used as one of the strategies to offload the demand on the need for N95s. And that was not just for surge capacity, but also for conventional operations. So elastomeric respirators, however, are somewhat unfamiliar to many healthcare environments where N95s have been kind of the standard respiratory protective device for so many years. So let's kind of orient to what these devices are. So both elastomeric respirators and N95s are tight fitting air purifying particulate respirators. So all respiratory protective devices have something called an assigned protection factor, which represents the level below which um, as a fraction you would expect to provide a level of protection. And both N95s and elastomeric half face or half mask respirators have an assigned protection factor of 10, um, although there's some evidence to suggest that elastomerics actually may have a higher assigned protection factor in that, but they still carry this designation. Um, both forms of respirators use filters that provide at least um, filtration efficiency of 95%. Depending on the elastomeric filter that's being used, you can use a 100% uh, 
uh, filtration efficiency filter as well. So they provide at least the same minimum level of filtration e efficiency. And both are tight fitting respirators, so fit test is required by both. So elastomeric respirators were first used at the University of Maryland Baltimore campus back in 2009. And why did that happen? So the 2009 H1N1 outbreak caused N95 shortages. And the hospital was unable to acquire them at the volume that they needed to protect what seemed like to be an entirely large population of healthcare workers. So the safety director at the hospital was familiar with elastomeric respirators from general industry and saw them as reliable. And so the, the decision was made to pursue this form of respiratory protection for healthcare workers. And um, certain healthcare workers in the hospital were identified in areas where it was probable that these workers would be encountering patients with influenza-like illness. And so on the inpatient side, that included the acute care medical units, the medical intensive care unit, the emergency department, pediatrics, um, as well as places like radiology and phlebotomy. Um, and for the ambulatory practices, the, these respirators were provided for all of the workers in many of the outpatient clinics. And this form of respiratory protection um, was continued as a primary form of respiratory protection long after the H1N1 crisis had passed. Um, and really the hospital started to kind of transition away from this towards the end of 2016. But even at that time, about a quarter of the existing elastomeric respirator users wanted to stay in that respirator and, and desired not to change back to N95s. So the devices that were used at that time um, was the respirator was the 3M 7500 series elastomeric respirator, which provides face masks in small, medium, and large sizes. Um, and they were equipped with a 3M compatible 7093P100 particulate cartridge filter. And I think the key thing on this was that the filters are included inside this hard plastic case, so they're covered, which also allows for that cartridge to be cleaned. So as this practice had continued, you know, as of the summer of 2014, out of a, you know, urban downtown Baltimore medical center with over 9,300 employees, there were over 5,600 employees in respiratory protection programs, about 2,000, just over 2,000 of which were in tight-fitting respirators, so either elastomerics or N95s, and the majority were in elastomeric respirators at that time. So that environment created kind of a key setting for us to study the use of elastomeric respirators. And through a process that included key informant interviews, focus groups, as well as a very large electronic survey, we studied whether responses gave us answers to understand are elastomeric respirators an acceptable meaning they're acceptable to the users, as well as a feasible in terms of storage, cleaning, supply. Are they an acceptable alternative to N95s in healthcare? And from the large electronic survey, we got uh, 1,152 respondents, of which 432 were elastomeric users. And I will share some of the findings from that time. So, Related to user acceptance, and we explored a variety of concepts, comfort, communication, sense of protection, and kind of confidence that that respirator will protect based on the training they've received. Of the three types of respiratory protective device users, the elastomeric users scored their respirators highest 
in sense of protection provided by the respirator and in confidence that the respirator would protect them based on the training or fit testing that they had received. And despite the elastomeric users scoring their respirators lower on comfort compared to N95s, but still in kind of an average range and lower to N95s on a communication rating, the elastomeric respirator users still stated that they would prefer to use that respiratory protective device in certain high-risk scenarios, such as taking care of a patient with known active TB or in taking care of a patient with pandemic influenza. So when we looked at the questions about logistics, we broke it down into storage and availability and then cleaning and disinfection. And so we asked users, is the respirator model and size you were assigned to use available when you need it? And you can see here that about 94% said that it was either always or usually available when you need it. So that sounds great. When we asked where it is located, however, those answers did not necessarily reflect the, the very overwhelmingly positive response we got on availability. So ideally, when you are using a respirator, you want it to be available immediately, right? If you are at a patient, you know, at a patient room, you want the respirator available there. And what we saw is that, you know, 5% of the respondents said in a drawer near the patient's room, and 60% said somewhere in the patient care area, like a locker. But that meant that 35% said something else, something that was not necessarily convenient. And a large percent said that it, it was someplace totally remote. So um, what we also saw from these storage location reports was that um, inconvenient storage location was more often reported in non-compliant elastomeric respirator users. So let me explain that. So we had identified um, kind of post-2009 and going into kind of the 2016 time that there were some users of elastomerics who even though they were assigned to use an elastomeric, when it came down to what they were normally using, they were using an N95, which meant that they not necessarily had been fit tested for it. And so these users were doing something that, was, that reflected non-compliance. And so what we're trying to understand is whether, what are the issues that affect compliance? Is it user acceptance? Is it, or is it one of these logistical issues? And certainly, storage location was one of those factors that did link to non-compliance with expected use. And what we saw was that more like, that was more likely to be seen among workers who were mobile, who didn't work in one fixed location. So for example, a respiratory therapist might be tasked with going to multiple units around the hospital, as opposed to always being in the MICU or always being in the ED. And we saw among respiratory therapists and physicians that that practice occurred more frequently. So decontamination, which has always been, I think, the elephant in the room in terms of making elastomeric respirators succeed in healthcare. You want to know, is the respirator clean? So we asked users um, how often they wipe the respirator with an alcohol pad or disinfectant wipe after each use. Now remember, these questions were asked in 2016. We were not in the middle of a pandemic, and most of the time these respirators were used was in care of patients being ruled out for TB. And in that question, we saw that 58% of users always wiped the respirator after use, um, which in the setting of a communicable disease, that's, that's unacceptable, right? That is too low. Um, and certainly, um, for compliance with disinfection, your goal is for that to be 100%. And even more impressive, we, um, 
the expected practice at the time that we asked the questions was that people are wiping the respirator after each use. But back in 2009, when the original guidance came out, there was an expectation that users were going to take off the filters and put the face mask in soap and water and clean it. And so we asked people in 2016, how often do they ever remove the filters and wash the respirator with soap and water? And you can see here that that was not regularly occurring. So there were challenges that we saw in 2016 related specifically to decontamination. But what is important here, I think, is that we saw no difference in the reporting of the frequency of the decontamination practices by user group. And so there were not significant differences between the compliant and the non-compliant users on this topic. So putting that all together, we saw that user acceptance is not a critical barrier towards putting elastomeric respirators in healthcare, but storage and assuring availability are significant barriers to expected use. So you've got to come up with a solution on that. And that while disinfection was not a barrier to expected use, there was inadequate compliance when it was left to the individual. And so our, our thoughts on that is that that can probably be taught, um, but strategies to centralize this would bypass that and take some of this variability out of the picture. All right, so, how, so what are some of the ways you can troubleshoot on this? So if we think about storage and availability, so when you are planning for elastomeric use, you can either do this by using kind of a centralized supply of elastomerics, or you can use kind of individual supply, and that leads to individual maintenance. So an example of this is um, at the Texas Center for Infectious Disease, which is one of the other sites in the country that has been using elastomeric respirators pre-COVID regularly, um, each user there is expected to carry their respirator around in a backpack. Um, so that would be an example of individual kind of readiness. Um, another pilot elastomeric study from Canada in 2013 kind of rolled these respirators out in their medical intensive care unit, and they had set it up that those respirators would go down to kind of the central processing area for cleaning at the end of the day. But in that study, the practice failed, not because they didn't have the cleaning protocol set up, it failed because they didn't identify staff to transport the respirators from the units to the cleaning area. So the take home here is that you can have a central cache of respirators, and if you're gonna do that, you need to identify staff in advance to make sure the respirators are in the right place at the right time and assure them that that is their job. Um, and then if you are expecting the individuals to keep up with their respirators, it makes sense to provide a means of readiness. As far as cleaning and disinfection is concerned, um, what is important to think about with these respirators is that when they are worn, I mean, we're very cognizant thinking about microbial contamination right now. So disinfection is removal of the microbial agents. So you've got to have a strategy there. But facial oils get on these respirators and um, inadequate removal of facial oils or other just kind of soiling agents may make it harder to disinfect. And so there needs to be some way to remove kind of the dirt as well. And there, I think, are three very kind of um, pertinent studies on cleaning and disinfection here that have been published. And the most recent um, report came out of the Applied Research Associates Group where they studied both automated and manual reprocessing of elastomeric respirators and were able to demonstrate that the respirators were able to be rid of virus and they were able to maintain fit and durability after multiple cycles of cleaning. So I think that, that study was extremely important in getting this out. Um, as far as do, it would be extremely convenient if all you had to do was wipe down these respirators with a disinfectant wipe. 
And so we tried to explore the question of, do you have to wash it in soap and water, or can you just wipe it down with a disinfectant wipe? And this, uh, our results were published in the journal of the International Society for Respiratory Protection earlier this year. And what we were able to demonstrate um, by simulating transfer of facial contaminants from a user to the mask um, by using GlowGerm um, gel as a simulator of facial product was that even with just using the disinfectant wipes, it didn't get all of the facial contaminant off. So um, from, um, from a facial contaminant standpoint, you need this detergent step. And from a viral contaminant standpoint, soap and water is probably the, one of the most kind of expedient ways to, to remove virus. And so the answer is you need more than just the disinfectant wipe to assure that the masks are clean and disinfected. So what are we doing at University of Maryland? So during COVID response, in our ambulatory practices, um, the elastomeric respirators have been the main form of respiratory protection ever since 2009. That never changed. And so those clinics are kind of scattered. They're not all in one big building in one centralized location. So for those environments, the elastomeric respirators are individually assigned and the individual practices are expected to clean and maintain the respirators. And policies, protocols, and videos on how to do this are publicly available on our website. And um, you can see that that link is at the bottom of a page, but it's the, um, uh, I think it, these resources are gonna be shared at the end of the webinar. So these are all available and those are specifically tailored to the expectation that you're going to clean these respirators in um, like a, an outpatient clinic. But at the hospital, this is a large, large setting. And um, so elastomeric respirators here are part of the pandemic respiratory protection plan. We have certain users using N95s and we have other users using PAPRs. The expectation is that um, after each patient care use, the entire respirator is to be wiped down with a disinfectant wipe. And most of our um, disinfectant use is with Oxivir TB wipes. But at the end of each shift, day shift and night shift, the respirators are dropped off at a PPE distribution center where they are collected and logged and taken for a centralized, standardized cleaning. And this is based on that Bessesen and basically the Lawrence Protocol out of Applied Research Associates, where they are cleaned and then disinfected and allowed to dry. And by this means, we are using a shared supply. And this has allowed us to supply respirators to the most people at the time when they need it. So in summary, elastomeric respirators have been used in healthcare even prior to COVID-19. For their use, facilities must have plans for assuring storage, availability, cleaning, and disinfection. Cleaning and disinfecting protocols do exist and they can be adapted for local use. And elastomeric respirators can alleviate some N95 shortage burden. Thank you very much. I will take questions later when we have our panel discussion. And for more information on elastomeric respirators, this, um, this information sheet is available on the n95decon.org website, and it can be downloaded and shared broadly. Thank you very much. Well, thank you very much, Dr. Hines. Uh, that was an excellent uh, presentation, and I'm sure it was an eye-opener for, for many on this uh, webinar who are not yet familiar with this type of uh, protection. Um, there are a number of, of questions that have already appeared in the Q&A and the chat box. Uh, please continue to put in those questions, and uh, we'll get to those questions uh, 
uh, after uh, the next uh, couple of uh, presentations. Uh, this uh, webinar today is likely to extend a, a few minutes beyond four o'clock just to get to all the uh, uh, Q&A. So uh, everyone uh, just uh, keep that in mind because we'd like to get to all the questions we can. So the next uh, presentation uh, before we get to the panel discussion is gonna be jointly uh, led by uh, uh, Dr. S uh, by um, uh, Hope uh, Waltenbau and Sarah uh, Angeli. Uh, Hope uh, and Sarah are both from the Allegheny Health Network in Pittsburgh, Pennsylvania. Uh, Hope is the Vice President of the Perioperative Services and um, Sarah is the Operating Room Education Manager. Today they will, just, they will be discussing how to protect your staff uh, during these pandemic times. Good afternoon, everyone. I wanna first thank you for your time today and your commitment to staff and patient safety. Um, we belong to, uh, we work for the Allegheny Health Network and it's a Highmark health company that serves the greater Western Pennsylvania region. We are composed of 12 hospitals, ambulatory surgery centers, health and wellness pavilions, along with the Research Institute um, and a group purchasing organization. Uh, we're extremely proud that we are clinician-led, um, and we have about 21,000 employees, um, and we have more than 2,500 physicians um, on medical staff. Uh, so a lot of clinical employees. Uh, we realized uh, very quickly into the pandemic that we, um, we knew that we were gonna have to move quickly with our N95 supply, and we watched closely our neighboring states, specifically New York. And uh, there were three things that we, we knew that we were gonna have to increase our supply for N95. We knew that we were going to have to um, preserve the, the, the product that we had on site. And um, we needed to find a way that we could add um, additional supply. So one of the early discussions um, at the beginning of the pandemic for our team was can we reprocess disposable N95? So we, we really, we pulled a team together and perioperative services was in, involved because of sterilization. We, we oversee at all of our centers, we oversee central sterilization. Um, all of the directors have a central sterilization background. And so we, we have the opportunity and the equipment on all of our sites to reprocess uh, disposable N95s. But at the same time, we, um, we had an opportunity to uh, partner with a Pittsburgh, um, a Pittsburgh manufacturing company who made elastomerics and uh, very quickly realized that, you know, the staff, they brought some of the product on site and we started to do a, a trial with the staff. Just r really, you know, just kind of, Stepping into the last American world, none of us had worn it before in the clinical setting, and we, we you know, worked with some physicians and our anesthesia folks and, and nursing staff, and they were all very comfortable with the masks. Um, we, you know, we have a physician leader, Dr. Chalaponda, who went back to our Highmark parent company, and uh, we were lucky enough that Highmark and Allegheny Health Network made uh, the clinical decision and the commitment to purchase 10,000 of these masks. And um, where we've kind of stalled a little bit was that we just weren't quite sure how many we were gonna get. So uh, we had to come up, you know, our, 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 next, our next step was coming up with a way to um, allocate these masks. And, and you know, I think that the, the, the best part of this was that you know, we, we talk about, I have this on this slide, is, you know, the lower cost. And I know this is gonna be a question that comes up, and I think I already see it coming up on, on some of the, on the questions that are popping up at the bottom, but this is definitely cheaper than disposables, as you can see, but there was never a time that the organization that I belong to ever once talked about the financial implications at that moment. We were really just focusing on staff, uh, safety, and um, I'm, I'm really proud of that, I wanna call that out. Um, but, you know, the, the, so the cost you're going to talk, you know, most certainly is going to be a part of it as you plan or if you're going to move into elastomeric. So um, that's something that you can absolutely, we can show you the financials. Um, it's definitely a savings. The operational um, efficiency, as you can see, the, the best part of these maps too is that we were 94% we were successful in fit testing. 
So um, we have three sizes. The company provides a small, medium, a large, and actually, as we looked at other companies, that's about standard. So those three sizes are standard. Um, as we move forward with this, um, we would like to see something a little different. There is just a small percentage of people that don't fit those three sizes, so we're going to keep working with the companies as they can develop something a little different, maybe a, a, an extra small. We kind of feel that especially some of our, our newer, younger staff could, could fit into that. Um, and, the, and the nice part of that is we have one mask, one fit testing, and, you know, to Stella's point, we, you know, that, that staff carries that mask and, and it's readily available. We don't have to figure out 10 different manufacturers. So super, super efficient. Um, and then the sustainability, you know, we, um, we were really kind of working with, you know, if we were going to start reprocessing N95 disposables, how many times could we reprocess them? You know, um, we had to keep track of that number. We were really kind of chasing that. So this is a, um, you know, th there's no number of uses that, you know, there, we've, the research and, and the company we work with has, has um, dedicated multiple hours of research to make sure that, you know, as we clean these multiple times that, that there's no uh, breakdown of the mask or to the elastomeric. Um, let's see. So our next step. So when I, when I spoke to uh, the 10,000, we weren't sure how many we were going to get. So the team came back to the table and said, okay, we got to come up with an allocation plan and so the physician who leads, he um, created this multidisciplinary team, uh, and Sarah and I got to be a part of that team, and really just determined who needs these masks first. So we were getting them in waves. Uh, the manufacturer could uh, commit to 1,000 masks for the first wave. And so what we did was, as you can see, this is a busy slide, but I wanted you to kind of see um, how we allocated that out. So you could see first wave, we made sure that the first wave was high risk and they were frontline employees. So as you can see, anesthesia, you know, CRNA, physician extenders, et cetera, it goes down, ED nurses, um, our EMS, of course, our COVID, um, our testing centers, our COVID, um, our COVID units were, were most certainly in that, you know, first wave. And then you can see where we moved to the second wave and then the third wave. Um, as we progressed, so week by week, as we progressed, the manufacturer could keep up with the demand. Um, we started to uh, move into, um, you know, staff who really just needed that uh, sense of safety. So not so much front facing, you know, 100% of the time, but they really felt, for instance, a, um, we might have a security guard who is not always with a patient, but could could interact sometimes, and they they asked for a respirator and. We did not say no, and that's another thing I'm, I'm proud of Allegheny Health Network is that if you needed the supply, you know, when we moved into these waves and we had the product, it was given to you. Um, and then the company also partnered with uh, local companies to make sure that we had a, a way to carry our uh, masks with us. So each employee was given a fanny pack. The fanny packs are worn by all of our staff. We carry them with us, and the last America's carried. So um, again, really proud of that. I want to um, I want to hand this over to Sarah because Sarah's going to talk about the cleaning and she's going to talk about uh, the education. So I'm going to hand it over to Sarah Angelilli. Thanks, everyone. Great, thank you so much, Hope. Um, so first, we're going to talk a little bit about the cleaning and redistribution process. So as we were coming on board with the mass distribution, we needed to figure out how to collect those and put them through our decontamination process through central sterile. And that was achieved by one of two methods at the hospitals. They were either quote unquote ordered and delivered by our clean teams or they came through a central distribution center up to the units where staff could collect them at the beginning of their shift. During the shift, they would don and doff according to hospital protocols, um, cleaning them and placing them in paper breathable bags between uses to ensure that there was no um, buildup or um, residue potentially with um, uh, the COVID virus. And then at the end of the day or at the end of the shift, they would place them into 
plastic bins, once again, that were left open and our clean teams could go to the units at specified time intervals, collecting the masks, bringing them down to central sterile to start our decontamination process on our decontamination side, moving them over to the clean side so that they could appropriately dry and then we would reassemble them and prepare them for redistribution back out to the staff. And with this, um, as you can imagine, in the middle of all the uncertainty of the pandemic, as we were introducing a new product to the staff, it took a lot of educational support. We have a fantastic team here that uh, we are so fortunate. They were very quick to jump on board and really help mobilize getting the materials and the training out to the staff. We decided to use a multimodal method um, to make sure that the staff was comfortable with the dotting and doffing process, performing fit checks, and understanding the differences between these elastomerics and the N95s or PAPRs that we, they were previously used to using. So we provided them print material um, that was assigned via our electronic learning management system so that we could have a record of training. We also provided in-person demonstrations, one-on-one -on -one or very small group. Each staff member had to provide a return demonstration of donning, doffing, and seal checks so that we knew that they understood how to appropriately use the mask. And then we also provided um, QR codes um, to the staff so that if they were on the unit and they just weren't feeling sure, that it would provide them the additional education um, and guide them through the process step by step. We mimicked this whole education component for our um, central sterile and clean team staff as well, providing them the education in multiple different modes so that they could understand how to disassemble, disinfect, reassemble, and then prepare all of the masks for redistribution. Um, and they all had competencies, of course, um, that they could uh, correctly complete all of the steps for those different components. Um, and if anybody has their phone out, that's actually a live link um, that's on the slide there that I believe takes you to uh, one of our cleaning videos. And then finally, just some of the obstacles um, for consideration. And I know Stella touched on some of these with her um, presentation and we're gonna talk about them in the Q&A session as well. The masks, um, as the staff wear them, they become um, increasingly more comfortable as the elastomeric um, gets more moldable. Um, we did notice in particular with some of our COVID units where staff were frequently wearing these for extended periods of time that they did get some skin breakdown similar to what we saw with N95. Uh, we did seek approval from the manufacturer to be able to use a skin barrier. Um, so we were able to implement that with our staff um, with some good success. Communication has been noted um, with the valves um, inside the mask. It does make it a little bit more difficult to communicate either in the context of teams with care partners or uh, with our patients. And that has been something that's been noted with the manufacturer. And uh, there are some things in the works that hopefully in the future can improve communication with this type of mask. And then finally, exhalation valves. Uh, we know that on the model we chose for the hospital, it is an unfiltered exhalation valve. So particularly in um, the um, procedural type of areas, um, all of those staff are required to continue wearing um, a surgical mask over top of their respirator. And in other areas, we are using um, face shields um, to cover that um, exhalation valve as well. So I think there's more opportunity to explore exhalation valves and best practices to manage that for infection control. Um, and with that, I thank you very much for your time and the opportunity today. Well, this is uh, Chuck McKay uh, from the American College of Medical Toxicology, and I want to thank uh, all three of our presenters uh, for for those presentations. We're going to move now into the into the panel uh, question and answer session, and and uh, Sarah and, and uh, Hope and.
and, and Svela will be joined by uh, three other panelists. I'd just like to introduce them uh, briefly. Uh, first, uh, uh, Dr. Uh, Shrichan uh, Chalankanka, who uh, is the uh, Chief Medical Operations Officer and a surgeon at the Allegheny Health Network. I think you saw his name on one of those papers that was referenced in the last presentation. He will be joining the panel. And also, we have uh, two uh, representatives from, uh, from uh, National Institute for Occupational Health and Safety, uh, Marianne uh, D'Alessandro. Uh, Dr. D'Alessandro is a director of the National Person Protective uh, Technology uh, Laboratory at NIOSH. And uh, Lee Greenewald. Uh, Lee is, uh, uh, Dr. Greenewald is a physical scientist at the National Personal Protective Technology Laboratory. So a welcome, uh, if all panelists uh, could uh, uh, unmute themselves or you can choose to do that uh, as long as you, uh, I'm sure you have no background noise there uh, as, as uh, we go through the questions. We do have a few questions that we've pre-planned uh, that actually looking through the questions that have come in are going to ad address a, a, a number of those. We will try to get to all of the questions that have uh, been put in as well. So why don't we go ahead and move to the, and the next uh, slide and we'll start with uh, those. And if I could uh, ask uh, Marianne, if, if you could uh, address this question. So are, are the EHMRs themselves, are they authorized to be used in a healthcare setting? We, we heard a little from Stella about the CDC's uh, you know, recommendations and, and use in different systems, but have they been authorized for use? Um, yes, so NIOSH approved respirators that have not undergone FDA clearance have been used in healthcare environments to keep workers safe for many years. And only NIOSH approved respirators are acceptable to provide appropriate respiratory protection under OSHA's 29 CFR 1910-134 standard in protecting healthcare workers from the transmission of airborne infectious diseases. Now, in 1994, FDA issued a memorandum on regulation of respirators in healthcare settings, and by it, FDA decided not to ex exercise regulatory control over respirators in healthcare settings since OSHA exercises regulatory control. Um, FDA currently is revisiting their position. However, during the pandemic on March 28th, as Stella mentioned, um, FDA issued an emergency use authorization permitting the use of NIOSH-approved air purifying respirators in healthcare settings, including elastomerics. And then um, NIOSH and OSHA also published the Hospital Respiratory Protection Program Toolkit, which describes the use of all air purifying respirators, including elastomerics in healthcare. And this toolkit was published in 2015, and NIOSH and OSHA are currently updating this toolkit, and it is an important resource for healthcare institutions using respirators. Thanks. Well, thank you. So at this point, the EUA stands for their use, but that's um, but that's outside of the UA is, is also, um, you know, it's not under the jurisdiction of the FDA. But there have been a number of questions that have come up about the, and it has been mentioned by all the speakers, the exhalation valves and the impact of those within the healthcare setting. So if we could go to the next slide with just a couple of those questions. And Marine, could you mention just you know, how that um, you know, how that, I guess, plays out. Are, are healthcare workers allowed to use these because of the exhalation valve? And, and what does, how can we respond to the concerns that have been raised uh, in the questions thus far? Yeah, that has been an issue that has been raised over the past several months. And respirators with exhalation valves do protect the wearer from SARS-CoV-2, but they may not prevent all the particles expelled by the wearer from exiting through the valve and therefore the virus spreading from the wearer into the environment. And that is so they won't be, may not provide effective source control. But one benefit of elastomeric and filtering face piece respirators with regards to source control is that they are designed to fit tightly to the face as Stella mentioned, and therefore air and particles are not leaking out around the edges or through the body of the mask, which can also occur with other types of face masks and, uh, and face coverings. Um, so until data are available to describe how effective respirators with exhalation valves are in preventing the spread of SARS-CoV-2 from the wearers 
to others, we recommend that wearing a respirator without an exhalation valve when both source control and respiratory protection are required. And if the respirators with exhalation valves are the only ones available, then they should be covered as Hope mentioned and Sarah mentioned, um, covering it with a surgical mask or a uh, that does not interfere interfere with the respirator fit. So we recommend a surgical mask with ties to put that loosely over the exhalation valve. So definitely uh, more research is needed to establish what is coming out of exhalation valves. And NIOSH is conducting research to better quantify this and provide additional guidance. And healthcare workers um, dedicated to COVID-19 patient care only and wearing respiratory protection should not require source control as they are caring for patients who have the virus. And therefore, respiratory protection incorporating exhalation valves, such as elastomerics, should be acceptable. And this also applies to filtering face piece respirators without exhalation valves as well. No, just I'm sorry, Dr. McKay, I think we've lost your sound. Can you hear me now? Yes. Okay, sorry. Uh, before developed symptoms, so with the source control issue and the use of these uh, surgical masks, is there likely to be an increase of work? Be noticeable by most uh, workers. So there has been one study that was published in 2010 um, by NIOSH that did show that there was not an increase in breathing resistance. Um, so we do not believe that should be a problem. Uh, so during surge demand scenarios and when respirator users may be around others who are not positive for the virus, um, we believe that there should be no issue in wearing these respirators with exhalation valves, and we shouldn't have the CO2 buildup or an increase in breathing resistance. So again, we do acknowledge that more research needs to be done in this area with regards to particles for elastomeric respirators, as well as all types of devices, including surgical masks, cloth face coverings, um, to see what's coming out of these exhalation valves. And we do have studies in process to better understand the benefits and risks of um, these configurations. Okay. Uh, Stella, uh, would you be able to address a little more about that in terms of the, the uh, comfort and, and the breathing resistance uh, from your perspective? Sure. So I can tell you from our previous study um, where we asked users to rate, like, how, how much do you like your respirator with respect to comfort? And it was a kind of scale of one to five, where one was very much dislike and five was very much like. And kind of the average score for the elastomeric users was 3.28. So kind of right there in the middle, um, the score for the N95s was 3.42, so it was lower than that. But it was really just average. So I think in terms of... Um, you know, we, we do know that when you have an elastomeric respirator on your face, you know, it does create some facial heat. And that same Robert study that Dr. D'Alessandro um, spoke about, you know, I think about 20% of the test uh, testees in that study, you know, complained about facial heat. Um, so I think that um, when you're kind of anticipating using this type of device, that is something you have to acknowledge that people are likely to experience. Um, but overall, um, the comfort's about average, similar to what it's like with other tight-fitting respirators. Um, in terms of the breathing resistance, I think, um, and I may be getting ahead of myself a little bit here, you know, there's been a lot of um, conversation about whether use of a tight-fitting respirator, um, what does it do to other kind of physiologic parameters, right? Does it does it lower your oxygen level? Does it raise your carbon dioxide level? Um, and you know, these are things that I think about as a pulmonologist as well. And um, this has been studied in N95s. This has also been studied in elastomerics. And in um, kind of healthy volunteers who were put on a treadmill 
for an hour walking at two and a half miles per hour wearing an elastomeric respirator. After an hour, the, the entire time they're on the treadmill, the oxygen level was 98%. So normal SpO2 in people wearing an elastomeric respirator for an hour walking the whole time. So I think that should provide some reassurance to healthcare workers that have not used a mask like this before and maybe it looks a little, it looks foreign. Um, and as far as the carbon dioxide retention, you know, it is true, you're using a mask and there will be some rebreathing of what is actually in kind of that dead space of the mask. And in that same Robert study um, on healthy volunteers, um, CO2 levels, and they measured this using a transcutaneous sensor, the, the levels at the end of an hour, they did rise a little bit. They rose about three points. And um, so in a healthy, um, a, a healthy person using a respirator, that should not cause any detrimental effect. Um, the thing to remember about any tight-fitting respirator is that a user should undergo medical clearance to wear a respirator. And most of the time that occurs through a hospital's employee health uh, department and where the practitioner is un trying to understand can this person wear a tight-fitting respirator that is going to add some breathing resistance. So people with respiratory disease, people with un you know, incompletely controlled cardiovascular disease. Um, and so those are the factors that are going to go into play to make a medical decision about whether it's right to allow someone to wear this. But for healthy volunteers, there should not be a problem. There's another study that was uh, performed out of Phil Harbor's group where um, they took actual volunteers with, with asthma and COPD and put them in elastomeric respirators to see were there specific changes in some of their physiologic parameters. And one of the things that I think was interesting from that was that the, the breathing pattern changes a little bit. And this has been borne out in other studies where um, the frequency of respiration, it, it slows down a little bit, and the amount of air that someone breathes in during normal breathing, it actually increases a little bit. And so I think that when someone is using this device, it may feel a little different, um, and it's probably because some of these kind of reflexive patterns that occur when someone is breathing through something that does add a slight, slight amount of extra resistance, but ultimately, the amount of ventilation that a person is performing is the same, oxygen levels are the same, and there may be just a very, very low increase in carbon dioxide, and that is the same as what happens with an N95. Thank you. Thank you for that uh, detailed physiologic explanation. Uh, Dr. Talakandra, could you uh, provide your perspective uh, specifically, I guess, regarding both the comfort but also communication during the course of, say, a prolonged OR procedure or, or maybe differentiating short and long procedures? Yeah, so, I mean, I think there's a couple aspects to look at in the operating room. Um, and, and I think a lot of the things around comfort and were addressed, but I think as a healthcare organizations have to understand that the, the operating rooms um, are, are really a big, a really a huge part of both the um, patient access as well as the the um, um, financial engines of the of the um, of the uh, hospital and healthcare networks. And what really had to occur um, in order to get those back, the, the elastomeric program was critical in us allowing to resume safe, um, relatively normal operations of the OR. And what I mean is that um, when you looked at some of the recommendations around how to restart ORs, it was really based on um, making sure you had adequate PPE. Um, we took a stance at Allegheny Health Network, which was not, I would say, the norm about universal respiratory precautions for our patients. There's no way we really would have been able to do that with an, uh, with an elastomeric program. For those of you who aren't familiar with the algorithm that was put forward by many societies, it was basically test when you can, screen, with sim screen for symptoms. If both of those, um, either one of those or both are negative, then um, the appropriate PPE is droplet precaution only. 
even in areas where um, there's a risk of aerosolization, like every single intubation, right? Every, um, you know, every single innovation under anesthesia. So we had this, to, for us to restart, we took a stance of treat every patient like they may be COVID positive, which means every anesthesiologist, every anesthetist, and everyone in the room during an innovation or aerosolization was able to have access to an elastomeric mask. Um, that being said, you know, we did have to have for the, for the issues around the exhalation valve, we do still have a, um, a, a stockpile of conventional disposable N95s as well as PAPRs for those procedures where um, that's appropriate. We have not found, um, because of that, we have really not found that um, we've had any comfort issues um, because we do have, uh, or, or issues with wearing the surgical mask. Um, because the time period with which they're wearing the elastomerics is really around the time of risk of aerosolization. And we have the advantage in the ORs of being able to um, wear the elastomerics during intubation. And then once the patient's airway is completely secure and their heads are covered with essentially a plastic bag, so there's no risk of droplet or aerosolization, the surgical team could, in theory, change to conventional surgical masks and with droplet precaution. So that really hasn't been a barrier at all to uh, to implementation as far as comfort, because we in the OR we have the ability to switch out to other forms of mask, and generally the airway is completely controlled. So, but but I can't emphasize enough the safety and security that our um, OR teams had, and the fact that while other teams were we're basing their uh, PPE, PPE choice on a complex screening algorithm, we were just uh, treating every patient like they were COVID positive. Well, thank you, Chris. Uh, so let me let me switch to, to Hope and, um, and Stella with the, a little more information on the on the communication issues that's already been raised. You know, the, the difficulty with communication to patients or colleagues is that uh, a significant barrier? Have you actually done any testing or simulation in, say, a sim center, you know, to, to work out troubleshooting or, or to practice with that, that kind of thing? Hope you want to go first? Sure, absolutely. Thank you. Um, so, it absolutely, it's a barrier. Communication, especially for patients who uh, lip read, of course, right? So th there is definitely a barrier. I will tell you that we've learned to speak louder. I'm, I'm a loud person by nature, so it works out well for me. But we have learned to speak louder. Um, you know, you're using a little more face, you know, hand cues. Um, it, it's muffled, especially with the surgical mask. Um, we are working, I know there's the company that we work with is, um, you know, taking that into account for the, for the next generation of these masks, looking at, you know, different opportunities. Um, the firemen, for instance, you know, they have a, um, they have a, a, a valve that they can actually speak through, um, and it's the, the audible valve is really nice. I just got to view that. So I, I think that's where we're going in the future is, you know, that would most certainly be, um, that, that would be something we need to, to enhance. Stella, that's pretty much what I have from the nursing piece. And I will echo that. So, um, you know, the, the voice is muffled, um, and when we did our prior survey, we asked specifically the, how, how much do you like your respirator with regard to communication? And again, this was on this one to five scale. And on that question, the average score for the elastomeric users was 2.76. So, and in comparison, the N95 score was 3.29. And so that was significantly lower. And I think that that is definitely a need that from a, from an industry standpoint, we hope that will get addressed. Um, I think that kind of in healthcare environments, one of the things that perhaps um, we can focus on when we're training people to use elastomeric respirators um, is to kind of think like pilots do, in that you are quiet and you speak when you need to communicate something, and it allows the kind of the total level to, to kind of come down a bit. Um, there have been studies about kind of um, 
the ability to discern the voice while using the elastomeric respirators out of that same Canadian pilot um, pilot study were out of WorkSafe BC. They did a component of this where there was there's a there's a NIOSH kind of communication um, test that can be that can be used. And so so this has be has been tested before, and the respirator meets the um, expectations um, required there. And so um, at least in some of this um, additional testing, but um, you have to speak louder and you have to speak more slowly. Those are not necessarily bad things. But <laughs> um, So uh, let me just ask a couple other questions. And I do want to mention to all the participants that we are going past the hour. We will shoot to be done with Q&A by a quarter past. Um, but uh, please do hang in there with us. Uh, there were several questions that came in of, about some specifics about either comfort or its applicability in different settings. And let me just ask one specific one about eyeglass use or fogging. Is there been any studies or do you have survey responses um, that address that issue uh, on the, the elastomerics versus the, the N95s? And anybody can answer that. Well, this is Stella, I can start. I mean, this is a tight fitting respirator. So if it's got a good seal, you shouldn't have fogging. Um, if you've got fogging, you need to check your seal. Um, I think that um, with many of our users, you can wear glasses at the same time. And certainly we all are wearing eye protection right now in COVID and you can very successfully wear eye protection and wear an elastomeric at the same time. Okay. Anybody have anything else to add at that? If not, Stella, let me uh, start with you, but uh, be, anybody can jump in on this. You brought this up, the eye protection. What about the fluid issues with the use of uh, the elastomerics in terms of protection against splashes and all? Has there been a thought of using face shields on top of these or incorporating them at all uh, in terms of various manufacturers? So um, the the thing to know about elastomeric respirators that gets back to that issue about FDA um, approval is that FDA approves um, surgical N95s and surgical masks to have a certain level of fluid uh, barrier kind of protectiveness, fluid permeability. And because these respirators do not undergo um, the FDA kind of process, there's not an expectation that these masks have meet some criteria for fluid permeability. Um, however, these masks are made usually of silicone and other plastics, um, which, which are certainly going to be less fluid permeable than a polypropylene mask. Um, sorry, excuse me, more, more, less fluid permeable. Yeah, that's what I said. So, um, so I think that there's, there's not a kind of a specific stamp of approval on the mask about fluid permeability. Um, and no one had asked for that before. Um, and, and I'll kind of pause there and let anybody else answer the additional questions. So this is, this is Hope again. We require the face shields are worn and we do that to protect uh, the filters um, to, to the point that, you know, it is um, you know, polypropylene or, you know, a, a, a plastic, but the filters and the medium in the filters is covered with a hard plastic, but it's still, there's, there's a chance, you know, there, it's exposed to the air. So we know that once the filters are uh, saturated with fluid that, you know, the instructions for use are that they're negated and we have to put a new filter on. So we do have all staff cover, you know, with, um, with a face shield. And back to the original question, uh, to, to Stella's point, they are tight fitting and we know that if I, if I see somebody with their shield down and it's fogged up, there's usually a problem with, um, you know, I, I, I question it because we very rarely see anybody with any fogging with elastomeric. Right. Well, thank you. Why don't we Why don't we move on to the next set of questions here, uh, and uh, and actually to follow up a little on the idea of these protecting of the the filters and all. So, Marianne, could you start with 
with this uh, question is, uh, the, I'm sorry, if we could go to the next slide, with the uh, cartridges and filters themselves. Uh, do What kind of cartridges or filters, just the particulates, or gas vapor cartridges, useful, not useful? Sure, yeah. Um, so for these types of devices, particulate filters such as N95s or P100 filters are necessary to filter out the particles. And elastomeric half face piece uh, respirators, they need to be equipped with these particulate filters. So these filters may carry the N95 approval or other approvals such as the N100 or P100. And all filter types provide the same level of protection because the level of protection is determined by the style of the face piece. And the particulate filters, they may be disc or pancake style, but as um, both Stella, Hope, and Sarah have said that you want the filters that are encased um, in plastics and, or in some type of casing so they're able to be cleaned. Um, the pancake style filters do not have any casing on them, so uh, you would not be able to decontaminate those as you would be able to decontaminate the others. And so these may be coupled with a gas or vapor cartridge, but it's very important to have the particulate filter um, effectiveness. So um, as long as they have the NIOS approved particulate filter, they will be appropriate to help reduce exposures to the airborne particles. Thanks. So how do you know then when to replace these filters or replace the cartridges? Marianne, could you start that off? Sure. So in the COVID-19 guidance that was published by CDC and NIOSH, we describe in there that manufacturers' recommendations vary depending on the filter design and the circumstances of use. So we describe the conventional operations, and in conventional operations, OSHA only requires replacing filters where necessary, for example, when they're soiled, contaminated, or clogged. And generally, filters must be replaced during these times when they're soiled, contaminated, damaged, or when breathing resistance increases. And often the phrase of dirty, damaged, or difficult to breathe through is used in training. However, in healthcare settings, the breathing resistance will unlikely be a reason for filter replacement since filters should seldom, um, if ever, be loaded with heavy concentrations of dust. So depending on use, um, one manufacturer recommends the filter be discarded after each use, while another uh, recommends that the filter cartridge be disposed no later than 30 days after the first use or if no oil mists are, are present. And then other re manufacturers recommend only when the filter is dirty, damaged, or gets wet during decontamination or becomes difficult to breathe through, which could be months. So during surge demand scenarios, uh, provided that the cartridge integrity and the filters have not been compromised, the current practice shows that conservatively these filters could be used for about one year during crisis scenarios or surge demand scenarios. Um, and that's what we have in our guidance at this time. So the decision on when to replace filters should be made for each facility or department based on the specific manufacturer recommendations for that particular filter during conventional operations and in conjunction with the occupational safety and health and infection prevention personnel. Well, let me just ask one question before I go on to the to Hello, Dr. McKay. We seem to have lost audio. Dr. Wax, we move on with the Q&A? Yeah, so let me uh, just uh, end up with a few questions pending uh, Dr. McKay's uh, response back. So here's a question um, um, to, uh, uh, to Dr. Hines. Uh, you mentioned earlier about, uh, uh, you know, for some of the healthcare providers, you know, PAPRs might be a better alternative than elastomeric respirators. Could, could you please uh, 
um, explain that? Well, I think that, um, you know, not a single, a single respirator isn't going to be perfect for everyone. Um, and so when deciding on um, who, who should be assigned or uh, receive which respirator, I think some things to think about, particularly debating between an elastomeric and a PAPR, for example. So if someone cannot um, pass a fit test, that would be a reason to go for a loose fitting PAPR. Um, if they have facial hair and they are unable to remove it for whatever reason, um, then they're not going to get a good seal on their elastomeric, and that would be a reason to go for a PAPR. Um, I think that in terms of um, you know thinking about the level of protection, I think comes into play here. And um, while you know we are using respiratory protective devices in our facility for all aerosol generating procedures, regardless of whether the patient has COVID or not. Um, similar to what Allegheny Health is doing, that you know it you just have to assume that they have. Um, that they that they have COVID, and when you're doing an extremely high risk procedure, you've got to protect your your staff. And so, everyone's wearing a respiratory protective device for those tasks. Um, but there may be a reason to think about people who are doing airways, um, putting, you know, intubating, doing airway surgeries, um, and putting them perhaps in your most protective device. And so, that may be a papper. Um, and again, with that elastomeric respirator, it has the same assigned protection factor as an N95, but with, you know, a, lo a lot of what we're using with elastomerics have a higher efficiency, higher filtration efficiency filter than an N95, and with potentially a greater integrity to the seal, you can make an argument that there may be a higher level of protection that's being provided by an elastomeric respirator. But um, I think those are some of the things to, to keep in mind. Um, thank, you. Go on. thank you, Paul. I, I did want to just follow up, and I apologize, I dropped off there. Uh, with the regards to the change out procedures for those, uh, the cartridges and filters, Stella and then Sarah, could you talk about how your institutions implemented some of the guidance that Marianne talked about, since it seems variable by the manufacturers? in an industrial setting? Sure, this is Stella. Um, so we are doing the latter um, option that Dr. D'Alessandro spoke about. We are changing the filters when they are soiled, damaged, or become noticeably harder to breathe through. Um, and those filters are um, cleaned by wiping with a disinfectant wipe um, after each use and certainly at the end of each shift in the centralized location as well. Um, and I know one of the questions in the chat was whether or not they go back to the individual user. We are not sending them back to the same user. They go back on a completely decontaminated respirator, um, but they are not unique to the um, original user. And there's data to support that um, if there, you know, if there is live virus that gets on the filter, it will become trapped in the filter, and it should not dislodge um, going in a direction in a way that it could get to the user. So we feel very comfortable with what we're doing on that. Sarah? Yes, so similarly, um, we are changing ours out at the one-year mark or sooner if they become um, damaged, um, if the breathing resistance increases, or if they become wet. And we will post some guidance documents uh, on the web page as well, so people can use, the, use them when they're looking into this for themselves. Let's move on to those next questions, which do talk a little bit about that uh, supply chain. So. Um, I guess, Lee, could you tell us a little bit about the, you know, what is the supply chain like right now? Where can people get these? We've had several questions that have come in saying, you know, where do I find them? I went looking online while you were talking and I couldn't find any reputable dealers, um, as well as the differences between those with and without valve, uh, exhalation valves. Sure. Yeah, that's, that's a good question. So right now, uh, currently, we don't see evidence that the elastomeric uh, half mask respirator orders 
cannot be filled by manufacturers or PPE distribu distributors. Um, so this includes both large and small orders that are being placed. We um, are hearing that they, those orders can be placed and, and people are getting these types of respirators, um, including the face piece and the particulate cartridges. Um, one thing I wanted to note too is that there are multiple types of manufacturers and models of the elastomeric half mask respirators. So, um, you know, those presented today are, are you know, examples, but um, there are multiple kinds that uh, to find the NIOSH approved ones, you can go on NIOSH's website to the uh, certified equipment list to see a list of all of those that are NIOSH approved. Um, but another thing about uh, more evidence of the supply chain specific to elastomeric half mask respirators is that on August 10th, so just a little over a week ago, FEMA posted a publicly available notice on the Federal Register on a final rule that was related to the prioritization and allocation of domestic resources. And this was originally posted back in April, so this update um, was just an update to the original posting. Um, and this rule uh, placed a ban on certain PPE products that should not be exported out of the U.S. due to high domestic demand and limited supply. But this current rule that was just posted August 10th has removed elastomeric uh, half mask respirators and their corresponding cartridges from this export limitation uh, since there are no indications that, that supply is not meeting demand and that FEMA has been able to fill all orders within the past 45 days. So that's publicly available. So um, like I said, you know, right now what we're hearing is that they, they can be purchased. Um, you may have to check multiple distributors, but um, you know, that, that may change, but that's what we're hearing right now. And you mentioned that that listing you know, is available on the, the NIOSH website, so that will be a resource we'll post as well that people would be able to uh, access. Well, there have been several questions, and Lee, maybe you or Marianne could address this as well, about uh, some of the medical clearance issues uh, regarding OSHA regulations within a fit test program. And my take from your presentations is that these masks fall under that same as a tight fitting respirator and that those are, you know, specifically uh, listed out uh, under OSHA guidelines or regulations within the fit testing program. Is, is that accurate? Are there any differences uh, between these and N95s? No, no. So all NIOSH approved respirators um, would follow the same, um, you know, elements in the respiratory protection program as required by OSHA. So that, uh, you know, element, including medical evaluation, um, applies to all NIOSH approved respirators. And, and those elements are outlined in OSHA standard 1910.134. Thank you. So, no differences. Could a uh, hope, uh, maybe uh, in terms of your experience at Allegheny or, or uh, Stella, uh, Dr. Heinz from the uh, University of Maryland, could you speak at all to some of the issues on that practical side, uh, when once you came to the uh, manufacturers that you did choose, and not to promote their products only, but was how long a process? How hard was it to get uh, identified people in your region who would be able to assist with supplying these? Well, this is Hope from Allegheny Health Network. Um, I think that we had the luxury of having the manufacturer in our backyard. So we had a Pittsburgh-based manufacturing company, um, and so we were partnering with them on, a, a, you know, previous projects, and so they were at our elbow for everything. So as we move forward, as you know, this is so fluid. Everything that we were developing and policies and processes, they really, um, they really partnered with us. So they had, um, they had teams that, um, you know, were, were really right there 24 hours that we could talk to and and as they got product in you know they most certainly we were um, in contact with them and as we were moving forward with questions and you know we came up with a few stumbling you know blocks with you know fitting and could we get different sizes and uh, changing our orders for instance they they were right there helping us so um, I think that that might not of course be the same across the country with different companies but we had that luxury 
And I don't know if I can elaborate on that as fully as you might like. Um, I think on our ambulatory side, this this was kind of an um, a purchasing process that was much smaller, fitting like under a thousand workers. And um, at, but on both on the ambulatory and on the hospital side, the relationships with the um, PPE suppliers already existed, and it it was just a matter of requesting a specific item, I think, originally. And so, um, again, that relationship had already been there dating back to 2009. And so um, it, it kind of, it, it was an easy path forward to be able to proceed. But I think even back in February when um, there were efforts made to get additional supply, um, you know, we had to wait a bit. And, um, even with kind of that process already formalized. So, um, but, but I don't know if I can give you more specific details on who talked to who and how they made that happen, <laughs> except that we already, we already had kind of the mechanisms in place through our PPE kind of purchasing structures for the hospital. Well, th thank you. Uh, Lee, could you address this last question on here? And uh, this, this, just what other efforts are going on right now to expand the uh, elastomeric use in the healthcare setting? Sure, yeah. So currently, the um, Strategic National Stockpile, or SNS, is working on procuring a large amount of elastomeric half mask respirators, as well as their associated filter cartridges, um, to be stored and distributed to healthcare entities. And so NIOSH is partnering with the SNS to assist in the distribution strategy, um, along with developing a best practices implementation guidelines to accompany the distributed elastomerics so that hospitals who are not as experienced uh, with using these types of respirators would have this type of information to, to go along with those products. Um, and actually, the, the speakers that you heard from today are assisting with the development of that best practices implementation guideline document. And so, um, in addition with uh, collaborating with the SNS, NIOSH is working on a federal register notice to receive input from the public on this distribution strategy and to identify those organizations that may be hospitals, dental communities, first responders, nursing homes, to potentially receive a portion of these procured elastomerics with the commitment that they would provide their experiences to NIOSH and PBTO in the form of a report. So things that we've touched on today about their user acceptability and comfort. Um, so this notice is not posted yet. It's currently uh, under review, but it will be posted as, as, soon as, as soon as we can. Thank you. Uh, just two more questions and, and then we'll close out the session. And thank you for everybody hanging in here extra. Uh, well, first, I go to uh, Dr. Chalakandra. You mentioned before that you're part of the supply chain issues uh, within the Allegheny Health Network, um, and we saw the the list uh, that uh, everybody was hope it presented on and on the priority of, of allocation. Uh, do you have a kind of just summary statement for how you would see these um, the elastomerics fitting in to uh, a system wide use of uh, of fitted masks? Yeah, I, I think I think having that prioritization table in a very transparent manner was is probably if I have to say what can one organization do um, to make sure this program is successful is having that table put in place right away. And and how we calculated was we looked at our caregivers' um, job codes based and based on their job codes we went to predict well how many of them utilize more than, you know, would utilize a disposable N95 every shift or, um, you know, multiple ones during a shift. And we basically went with the strategy of let's not, let's um, make sure that while we still have a stockpile of N95s available, let's start a process by which we can start eliminating the use of uh, disposable N95s and maybe even go to a strategy where we never have to reprocess N95s and anybody who doesn't have an elastomeric is getting a brand new N95 as the alternative and not a, not a reuse. And the way we did that was we really went, we had a clinician-led 
Um, I, you know, I can't stress the value of having a clinician, doctor, nurse, respiratory therapist, um, all at the table to make these decisions. Because ultimately what we've learned is talking to some supply chain um, executives throughout the country was they would get a shipment of, let's say, 2,000 um, elastomerics, and, and they wouldn't get distributed. And when I would ask why, they said, well, we didn't know who to give them to, and we, we didn't want to have the perception that we were favoring one group over the other. And I think the key to avoiding that is to say, look, we're ordering a total of X number of thousands. We may only get 500 every few weeks until we get to that level, but we're going to have a fair and transparent way to distribute them. And the first phase of distribution may, um, may um, focus around sharing masks with the second phase of getting more people out. And then the third phase, everybody in the first phase gets their own, then everybody in the second phase gets their own, and, and so on. So I would, I would emphasize the importance of that, because the worst thing that can happen is you have two ICU nurses next to each other, one has an elastomeric, and one is using a reusable N95 or an N95 that's been reprocessed several times, and and just just the um, just the issues that 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 creates in the environment in the, in the caregiver environment is just not worth it. So um, I, I don't think there's a limitation to supply as much as it's going to be phased. So I I can't emphasize enough. Plan ahead. Plan ahead. Get that table that we made similar table in your organization first. And then start ordering the masks. Thank you, uh, Dr. Heinz. Do you have anything as a different perspective, or or echoing that from the University of Maryland? No, I totally support what Dr. Chalakandra just said. I think, um, you know, we we had similar concerns among our healthcare workers about pappers. Like, why does this person get a papper? Um, mm -hmm. And so I think um, just kind of education and transparency as to why this group is being allocated to this. Um, it just, it, it has allowed for us to provide a much greater um, education to our healthcare workers about respiratory protection equipment and how it works and kind of understanding how it works in the context of risk. All right, well, I'd, I'd like to thank all of our panelists for their uh, expertise and their input and their willingness to respond to all these questions. Uh, I think we've covered most of them, though if we have not covered your question, the uh, presentation itself will be up so you can review the slides and, and the audio as well. And uh, certainly do uh, go ahead and send any questions into ACMT and we will attempt to address those in FAQs if we have not adequately addressed them today. Uh, Paul, do you want to go ahead and, and uh, you know, give a little uh, presentation of what's going to be coming up next? Sure. Uh, thanks, Chuck. And again, thanks to all of our uh, speakers and, and panelists and, and for Dr. McKay to leave uh, really a riveting uh, presentation today. Much uh, appreciated. As mentioned, this webinar uh, in its entirety will be up on our website uh, by Friday and we'll let everyone know once it appears in, in the URL. Um, any questions, again, can be addressed to us at, at info, dot, uh, info at acmt.net. Next slide. So uh, next week, we're going to be taking off a week, but we'll continue our webinar series on September 2nd at, at, at 3 p.m. Eastern time. At that point, we're going to have an interesting presentation on, on clotting disorders and COVID-19. As uh, most of us have recognized that there are very significant hematologic uh, components to, to the unraveling of, of the COVID-19 disease. And Dr. Jeffrey uh, Klein, who's uh, an expert on thromboembolism, will be presenting uh, on that topic on uh, September 2nd, 2020 at 3 p.m. Next slide. So I'd like to again thank everyone. Uh, we have our prospectus, which outlines uh, both upcoming webinars as well as all the past webinars. This is up on our website. Uh, feel free to take a look. Uh, and everyone uh, have a good day. Thank you.